Uh, I went to work for GE. There were a lot of uh, Clarks and grads that had, had been at GE before me, and just I found out just like last week, Tony, I found out that uh, my grandmother's cousin was a graduate from here uh, many, many, many years ago, and also worked for GE. I didn't, know, I didn't even know that. But <clears throat> um, so, so bottom line is, I think the start I got here at Clarkson, which was really good, uh, combined with the performance, I guess, of the graduates that had gone before me and were, you know, highly regarded at GE, uh, really kind of helped me to get in there. Number one. And then number two, to uh, um, you know, get have a favorable, let's say, a favorable start reputation because I was from Clarkson, right? And it it really mattered. It mattered a lot. And um, you know, so I, I kind of set out to build a career. And when I graduated, I graduated in a pretty good year. I, I had like five job opportunities, um, and you know, I chose the GE one because it was making aircraft engines, right? And I went on an interview down there and a tour of the factory. I said, oh my God, this is like a dream. Every manufacturing process uh, known to man is used somewhere in making jet engines. And, um, you know, it was a big facility and it was by Boston, so I, you know, I got to go live, uh, live by a big city. And, uh, so I went down there and I got in a training program and, you know, I spent, um, a lot of time in my early career, uh, what I would say is building a foundation, right? And, you know, I went on a training program, so that was four quick assignments. And I, I used those four assignments to, to really try to figure out how the place worked, you know, how the different jobs fit together to, to make a big company like that work. Uh, and, and then also to kind of decide what I wanted to do when I got off of this uh, training program and you know I, I uh, you know I think back at some of the key things that happened to me um, I'd say one of the very early things that happened to me uh, was that I got an opportunity for a promotion or for a higher job level um, and I didn't. I turned it down. I didn't want to take the job because it was a. It wasn't in my game plan for the things that I wanted to try and uh, experience. You know, for for the future, for you know what I ultimately wanted to try and accomplish. And you know, I was scared to death that they were going to fire me. You know, for for not wanting to take this job. And, and I learned the importance of a mentor. Right, a mentor, somebody who in the organization, you know, was respected and had the perspective of how things worked. And I went to this person, and the person asked me, "Why don't you want this job?" And I explained to him, "You know, I want that job over there because that job over there is going to teach me, you know, this key thing that I think I need to know if I want to get to that job over there." He says, "You know, you know that's right. He's probably right." And so this guy. Uh, ran interference for me and made sure that the organization kind of understood that I had a game plan. And I, I kind of learned here that, the, that was, there was a couple lessons. One was that the or, a company will try to put you into a spot that is the best thing for them, right? If you've got a skill or they need something, they will try and move you, uh, you know, into that to that role because it's good for the company. And you know, I had to assert myself a little bit because I didn't it didn't fit what I wanted to do. And the company respected that. So I kind of learned, you know, a couple of really important lessons. And then from then on, you know, I was really much better at this whole process of trying to map out a career. You know, and ultimately I had 19 different jobs at GE before my 36 years was over, and, um, and I loved every one of them, really. Maybe with the exception of one, but I loved almost all of them. Um, and you know, the thing that I loved about the, 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 the big company was that you just never stop learning, right? I mean, this, if you think you're done learning when you leave here, you know, you're wrong. Right? It's really just the beginning. You begin to kind of um, learn 
you know, specifics about your company or your situation, whatever it is, and, and you are, you know, the whole lifelong, it's a lifelong learning process. And with GE, I worked in three different industries, uh, aviation, making jet engines, I worked in the energy business, making gas turbines and, you know, all the power generation kind of stuff, and then in oil and gas, where we made subsea equipment and large-scale LNG compression trains and, you know, all sorts of big stuff. Um, you know, so constantly learning. And, and uh, you know, when I look back at that, I, I came to, in the end, you know, toward the end of my career, you know, after uh, all those jobs and I became vice chairman, my job really changed. And I, my job became kind of almost like a teacher right, or a mentor. And, it, and really, it was no longer about me. It was really about the next generation of leaders and, and trying to help them. And, uh, you know, the, uh, as I started to try and do that job, right, I kind of looked back and said, well, how did I get to where I am? And, and I really, I broke it down into th like three main things, three main things, um, or, th or phases, I guess, of my career that kind of let me get all the way from a foreman on the shop floor to a vice chairman of the company. And, um, you know, so the three phases, the first phase of my career um, was really all about what I'll say is technology, right? It was learning the product, learning how the organization works, what does quality do, what does manufacturing engineering do, what does design engineering do, how do all the things fit together and, and make the company work, and then experiencing a number of those jobs um, you know, so that I can kind of understand from the perspective of that job, you know, what is, how do they get their thing done? And, and, and this is maybe the first point where I really came, came to understand uh, how Clarkson helped me a lot, right? Because I think back when I was in school, the whole interdisciplinary thing was like not very uh, much of a big deal, okay, around the country. Here it was a big deal. It was a lot of interdisciplinary kind of uh, opportunities to learn, um, and you know when you get into business, it's not there's not one function that makes it all happen. It's how all the functions work together, and you know and, and what I learned here was really how to do that, right? How to work with other people from different disciplines to make something happen. Uh, and so really, the first part of my career was really all about that. That was a lot of years. I mean, that was, I'm going to say, you know, maybe like up to 13 years, I did stuff like that. Different jobs from different angles, learning different technologies, the hardware technologies, and so on. And then the next phase of my career, excuse me, was, um, you know, equally challenging, but in a really different way. The next phase of my career was really about leadership development, right? So I'd been a foreman on the shop floor. I'd have a small group of, uh, you know, engineers or salary people working for me. But the next phase was when I had to, like, be responsible for a whole big organization, like 1,400 people or, you know, something of that size. And, you know, the whole, series of uh, strange things that goes along with that, right? Because when you get a big organization, there are a lot of agendas, right? And not everyone is motivated by the same thing. And, uh, you know, you got to find a way to get the most out of that group of people. And, you know, and you make mistakes, right? You learn what works, what works here doesn't work there. Or, you know, I had non-union factories, union factories, I, you know, international factories. Uh, uh, you know, I, I had factories with people from multiple different countries around the world, and we had to get them all kind of moving in the same direction, right, to make the co company successful. <clears throat> so, you know, I did a lot of this uh, for a number of years, and, and uh, you know, made, had, made some mistakes and learned a lot, and then, and then, uh, you know, the next, kind of led me to the next phase. I became pretty good at that, right? I mean, I learned a lot about how things work, and I learned a lot about how you lead people. And then
then the next phase was probably the most challenging one of all. And this was when I became a business leader, a profit and loss center leader. And now all of a sudden, after all those years of really kind of focusing on the internal stuff, now I'm up there facing customers. You know, the first thing I learned about a customer is that they are irrational. You know, they don't, just because you make something doesn't mean they want it. You know, or they don't want it exactly the way you made it. And then there's, by the way, then there's also competitors, right? So you got competitors trying to uh, trying to beat you every day, and you've got customers, uh, you know, that have their own idea on how things should work. And you know, so I did this P and L thing all the way up through the CEO of the oil and gas business. And again, I mean, it, it was super challenging, and I learned a lot. I became very comfortable with it. I, I don't know that it was ever my best skill, although I think I did pretty good at it. Um, and it was probably the most fun because, I mean, I was out all over the world. I've been all over the world. And I've met, uh, you know, people from, I don't know, 70 countries or something like that, you know. And, and uh, you know, the, the people side of things was so cool. Being able to kind of see how people in uh, in Brazil live, or in uh, uh, Nigeria, or over in uh, Kazakhstan, or where, wherever, right? How do they live? And, and you know, the people all over the place are just like us, right? They just want to have a decent life. They want to, you know, take care of their family. They want to have a job and, and, and feel like they're part of something. And and you know, so all these challenges around the things that I learned earlier kind of combined with this global set of capabilities and, and you know, really good customers uh, was just a phenomenal, fun job. And I got to influence the technology. I had to make big deals. I mean, you know, creating contracts for hundreds of millions of dollars of, uh, of product and commitments and, you know, high stake stuff. Right? Um, that's why I feel so good now because all that pressure is gone. <laughs> And uh, you know, so I did. I did that for a while, and then you know, like Tony said, I came back to corporate. I, I, I was the vice chairman for the last two years, and I did a lot of. I've been focusing on the last two years on things I think that Clarkson's got their fingers into. This is uh, this idea of uh, innovation and advanced manufacturing. Right, manufacturing is really important. Okay, and. Um, in this country, we're rediscovering that, finally. Uh, and honestly, I think it's because technology is changing that it gives us an opening right, to, to reintroduce and be competitive with, with uh, manufacturing. You know, so like, for instance, one of the big things that I've been working on is uh, additive manufacturing, negative 3D printing. And I'm, not, I, and I'm not talking about like making cell phone covers. I'm talking about making jet engine parts or really complex uh, equipment. And um, you know, coming back to this idea of multidiscipline uh, and the importance of multidisciplinary uh, approach to things, additive manufacturing, I've come to understand this very well, but additive manufacturing is not cheap, it's not fast, it's, not, it's, it's got technological challenges to it, but what it can do is allow a fundamental change in the design of the approach and the thinking of how to design something. So just a quick example that, you know, from, a, from jet engines, we used to make, uh, you know, in the, in the guts of an engine, you have these fuel nozzles that are spraying fuel into the combustion chambers. And these fuel nozzles are super high, super high tech, right? Because that's where you control all your NOx emissions and your, you, you really have to keep the, I mean, it's the burn that allows the, the emissions to stay low. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, so it's super high temperature uh, uh, alloys and so on. Well, these fuel nozzles are super expensive, and they were made out of like 30 or 40 little tiny things that all had to get this kind of assembled and glued in some cases together. And if you can just imagine all the variation that goes with that, right? Uh, but they worked, okay? But your ability to really fine tune the jet engine uh, is limited by the variation of all those fuel nozzles. 
All right, and so the designers, when we started to really understand 3D printing, the designers changed their whole thought process. They said, wait a minute, we, we don't have to make this thing the same way, right? And, and they, they started to make a one-piece fuel nozzle. In other words, they would grow this entirely complex thing from, and make it one piece, one layer at a time. Super complex process. So the variation is like next to nothing now, right? I mean, the, the amount of variation around the combustion chambers is almost nothing, which allows them to really fine tune uh, and, and so this little, this little change, or this manufacturing process, but more importantly, the designers understanding its capability um, and changing the design to be to use what that process enabled it to use, they were able to get fuel, better fuel consumption in the in the engine, so it burns less fuel, and they were able to improve emissions, uh, and it turned out to be cheaper as well because it was one piece versus all these other, all these little tiny pieces coming together. So I mean, it was a massive, massive step forward. And so you know, I'd say the world is just like right on the cusp of this. Most people don't understand this yet. We haven't even developed, you know, we call it the red book data, right? The pro material properties for how you, uh, for how a, how the material behaves or performs when you know when you make something with this additive process and all the super alloys and all the different things. So bottom line is that this is like a very, very new topic area. And you know we got to get <clears throat> the country or the engineers and the manufacturing people all working together because you know it doesn't make sense to make this, the products by an additive that, that were designed, the old products, they need to be designed with an entirely new and different approach in order to take advantage of that new technology. And so if the designers don't know it, don't understand it, it will never happen. So it's kind of funny, you know, because manufacturing people typically were expected to make the things. Now, it's the designers who are enabling this new, this new stuff. So that's kind of what I've been working on for the last couple of years now, and a lot of mentoring of the next generation, and, and uh, of, of leaders and you know stuff like that, and then you know, and, and quite frankly, the last six months or, or a year, I've been thinking about what do I want to do next. You know, and Teresa and I are now spending a lot of time doing things that we want to do uh, that we didn't really have much of a chance to do for all those years. And but you know, I've signed up to be on this board of directors for a board company, and um, it's going to be a lot of fun. I can see that now. Um, I've been working with a private equity firm, um, and I'm going to do a local charity in Boston. I'm on the board of a charity that you know that we've been kind of supporting for a while, and then you know the Clarkson board here. So I'm going to have like stuff to keep me busy, but you know I'm going to retain enough control or freedom, you know, that we can go out and ski in the winter time, and you know we're going to go hiking in New Zealand in the fall next year or this year, and you know. After all those years of uh, nose to the grindstone, we're, I'm kind of feeling really good now. <laughs> and we have two new little grandchildren up in Boston, and so you know, I look back and I think, how did all this happen? How did this all work out so well? And you know, a lot of luck maybe, but I also think a lot of hard work and a lot of um, you know a lot of uh, you know applying the things that you learn along the way. And, uh, you know, with that I'd say, you know, the, the people that came before you here have really set a good stage for you when you go out in the working world, I think. Um, small companies and big companies. And, uh, you know, you can benefit from that. And then I would also say, you know, you have Someday, you will have the responsibility to make sure you're doing that for those who come behind you. And, and maybe that one, that's maybe one last little thing I'd say is that, you know, when I graduated, I had a ton of loans, okay? I was paying loans until I was 32 years old. And, you know, I didn't really think about Clarkson for a long time. 
when Cody came out and saw us in Cincinnati, it was at a good point in my life, right? My career had moved along and whatnot, and we said, yeah, we should get back, we'd like to get back involved again. And, and I'm glad I did. I wish that I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I wish I would have done it sooner because I'm not sure I was ready to. But what I, what I did not understand when I was here or even for the probably 20 years after I was here was how much the people that came before me enabled me to accomplish or helped to enable me to accomplish what I was able to do. And whether it was some of the scholarships that I got while I was here, right, or the works that they, that they did, uh, you know, being successful um, and, and creating this brand for Clarkson. Um, so, you know, I know you're not thinking about that now, okay, but I would just say, try not to forget it because someday you'll see it's really true. It really is. So, <clears throat> with that, um, I would love to answer any questions that people have. And you can ask anything, and I'm, maybe I'll answer it, maybe I won't. It depends what crosses any lines. The job that I did not like, the one, the one job that I did not like, that was what I have talked about with young people my whole career, is it's what I would what I describe as the million dollar experience you would not pay a dime for. And um, Teresa knows what I'm gonna say here because we I got um, drafted to go out and, and run a, 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 a area, a product line out in Cincinnati, like a 750 person factory. <clears throat> Cincinnati was a particularly difficult union and they were, you know, it was really a tough spot, but probably a month after I got there, uh, there was a little downturn in the industry and they decided that this was, they were going to close it. All right, and so my job went from you know being a leader to run this, try and run this business, to being a leader that had to close it. I had to transfer all the work somewhere else, you know, lay off a lot of people. I helped a lot of people find jobs, um, you know, and it was really hard. Okay? I mean, I was not very old at the time, and you know, it was scary. I mean, this was a tough union, and, and, and I mean, it was. I, I, and I, I was not a pushover with. And, and, but I, so I could hold my own, but still, you know, it was really difficult. But what I learned about, I learned a lot. I learned about people, including me. Number one, I learned that, okay, you can buck up and do this, right? And it, it's not going to be fun necessarily, but you can do it. And, and then after it was over, I got one of the best jobs I ever had, which is when we moved to Rubber, Vermont, and ran that factory for a couple of years and lived up in the mountains, and it was wonderful. <clears throat> but, um, and I also learned about the people, right, because the people, they knew that they had been kind of loafing, right, and that they were from trouble, that there were problems. And when it got to be the tough times, it was the factory down in Wilmington, North Carolina, that had been working hard, and they just, they, so they got to work. And this group there in Cincinnati, and I, that was my message. I kept pounding that home. You guys made your bet, right? And, and, and surprisingly, they understood. They understood it. And, and our productivity went up. And we shipped everything we had to ship without any problems. I mean, they went. They they went. Up. They went uh, through this with their heads held high because I think they learned that the, you know that they had to change. So, I mean, it was really a million dollar experience, but it sucked. <laughs> it was really hard. right from the first. And when I went to work there at Aircraft Engines in Lynn, 
Massachusetts. Um, like my first week on the job, I went to a dialogue meeting with this old guy. All right, and he was uh, he was in his jeans and he had just retired. All right, and I didn't know who he was. Okay. This guy's name was Gerhard Newman, and Gerhard Newman was the guy that started the GE's aircraft engine business and, and was like a legend, okay? He was like, a, came to, I mean, there's a street named after him out in Cincinnati from, you know, all the great things he did. But, you know, he told us that day, um, and this was like in 1979, so a long time ago, but he said, listen, this company is loaded with, uh, people who will draw a line in the sand, or who will say, at some point they'll say, you know what, that's not my job, right? My job's over here, that's not my job. And he said, consequently, the balls, balls get dropped all the time when you're trying to get something done. He said, if you are willing to be one of those people that stands in the cracks and doesn't let the balls get dropped, and it doesn't say it's not my job, so move a little bit right or move, move a little bit left to make sure that the jobs get done. He said, you'll get noticed, and you will be in demand your whole career. And he was right. I mean, first of all, he was right, unfortunately, that there's a lot of people like that. You know, and I learned about that, hey, these people are just motivated by different stuff. Right? They're not bad people. They just want to go to work at 7 and punch out at 3. Right? And, but nonetheless, you need those people to, to make it all work. And so basically, you know, what he was saying is, do what it takes to get the job done, and you get noticed. And I, you know, I said I had 19 jobs. <clears throat> I only, other than the first one, when I came from Clarkson, right, I only filled out an application one time in all those 19 jobs. I mean, I always got the opportunities where, you know, come over here and work, you know, will you go to Italy, will you do this, will you do that, or, um, you know, I mean, it was turned out to be a little tiny job, and that was true. I get a lot of other advice at different points in my career, but, you know, that was a one that I'll never forget, mostly because of this guy that I didn't know who he was, and he was like, he was like me, a really big deal. So you, uh, you mentioned the importance of the multidisciplinary approach at Clarkson, but what else do you think it was about your time here that enabled you to be successful later in life? Well, um, you, you know, the I think at, at the time the major that I took, right? I mean, I was it was called ID. I think the new the current name is much better. Interdisciplinary engineering and management that describes it a lot. I spent my whole career explaining what is ID, what is that, you know. And uh, the the opportunity to kind of do engineering classes, but also do business classes, was a major. I think there was only one other school in the country that did this at that time. It was on a place down in Texas, I think. Um, and it turned out to be a phenomenal major because I, I mean, I can manage engineers, right? And one thing I know about engineers is they love to make you think they know stuff that they don't, right? <laughs> and I learned how to see through them, right? I knew enough, I knew how to ask enough questions so that I could get to the truth, right? And this is as a manufacturing leader or a business leader and you know my willingness to get into that technology with them, that technology discussion with them, they loved it in the end. They loved it, right? They didn't want just some boss who was just going to ask them about the numbers. They loved having that discussion on the, on the technology and this and that. So I think that combination of a, of a major was a huge thing for me personally. <clears throat> and uh, you know, it was uh, the classes are. I'm sure many of the classes are the same as you can get in other universities, but to me, the, the setting here is small, right? It wasn't a huge place. Um, get to know everybody and good, uh, good teachers, and that was just a good thing. I, I remember one other class, I don't know if you still have it here or not, but I remember one that was my favorite class, and it, 
was called, it was a business simulation class. It was down in Snell, downtown, and they had a, one of those things where you are competing with four other teams in a business situation. You gotta kind of set your strategy and decide how much to spend on this or that marketing or this or that. And then you'd hand in your results on those, those four trade cards. You guys don't know what those are. <laughs> and, and then you'd get back the results. And it would be like, okay, your team's in third place or you're in first place. And then every week we'd be with different people on the team. So you kind of cir circulated around to everyone in the class. And you got to kind of practice, you know, influencing skills. And, you know, it was like fast results on business decisions to see how they affected things. Because you don't get fast results like that in the real world. It takes a long time to do something and you kind of wait to see what's going to happen. You know, so it was really cool. And, uh, you know, I thought, wow, that's for, that's a, in an engineering school, you know, having, it, uh, having these different uh, skills, these different uh, majors kind of all together in this setting was like helping us all. And everybody could bring something different to the discussion. So I mean, it was it was a really good class. It was fun. Okay. So uh, we're putting a lot of emphasis on teaching people, training people, introducing people to the idea of being an entrepreneur as a challenge to status quo. It can be done differently. If you go to a company like GE, do they value that character? Uh, yes, I think they do. Um, I mean, as big as that yeah, for sure. In fact, I'd say that's one of the big challenges is they value that, um, but it is hard. The system, uh, the system, kind of rolls on. So it, it's it's really hard to uh, to have everybody doing that, right? And and so the kind of the, the approach there has been to try to create these teams that can be entrepreneurial and, and try things. You know, and, and you know, a couple of things Jeff's done recently, he formed this new business called Cur uh, Current, and uh, be headquartered in Boston. And that's taken some, <clears throat> you know, some older technologies and putting them together in a way that they create a whole new business model around doing it. And, and they moved it out of, you know, the old place, Cleveland, put it in Boston in a, you know, in a very, um, entrepreneurial neighborhood uh, down in the seaport and um, and then they've hired uh, uh, you know some accomplished people to work with the team to help help make it happen so uh, and Eric Rice I think is one of the guys that wrote uh, lead startup I think um, you know he works with them constantly so GE is always trying to do this now, there are some places where you don't really want that, right? I mean, you guys fly, I assume you fly. I, I would also assume you don't want, like, uh, willy-nilly changes to jet engines that aren't proven out really well before you put them into, into the production. You know, so you want, you want innovation, but entrepreneurial uh, approach to it really doesn't work in a, in a product like that. So, yes, even in a huge company, there are a number of new opportunities. A great example of, of a big change. Now, you know, we're, we were always an East Coast company, and Jeff uh, hired a, a, a big leader away from Cisco and started a uh, bought two buildings and, and started hiring people from uh, out in San Ramon, uh, in the Bay Area, uh, from a lot of the uh, you know the companies out there that. Uh, are so driven by uh, software. And so we've created a software center out there with people that are very good at this. And they pair now with, around the products, the, the designer of the aircraft engine lives in Cincinnati. They know the mechanical engineering, the aero, and the, you know, heat transfer, and uh, all the right mechanics to make the product work. But the data people now, are bringing uh, new uh, ways to analyze how the thing works. All right, correlate establishing correlations that we never could do before because we get so much data so cheaply, manage it so cheaply, and, and, and 
write algorithms to surveil huge populations of engines. And so it's an entirely new, uh, very entrepreneurial, innovative approach to driving improvement into a product that is really good to start with. And they're making an amazing, uh, amazing um, discoveries. You know, that things that are that, that the, historically we never could have found. And, uh, so yeah, it's it's a challenge to, to have that kind of a culture in a big GE, but believe it or not, it, 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 it's there and not everywhere, but it's there in many places. You know, the melt and the uh, healthcare uh, equipment business like ultrasound and CAT scans and MRIs and stuff, they have to be that way because that is such a competitive and fast turning the technology turns so quickly that they have to be um, that way in order to Anyone else? Yes. So I see like a common theme between like successful individuals, whether it may be in the business industry or technology industry. They all have sort of like resilience, uh, whether it be confidence, socialized skills, diverse skills that they have. What would you say is one skill set or something that you look for for the person who went up the ladder and who felt like this was the most necessary skill or one of the most prominent skills that um, I had in becoming more successful. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to answer it on a couple different angles, right? The first angle is I think um, people who take ownership and work to deliver something always stand out. They, and they, and they, they may fall down, but they get back up and they keep going, right? And so there's a drive, it's ownership. It's a drive to, to not push it off on someone else. Sometimes, you know, you got to make sure that they're working together with other people, playing well. But, but if there's that real drive to, 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 to deliver. That, that's kind of universal. The other thing I would say, though, is different generations seem to have different things. And, uh, you know, it's hard to explain, but your generation is very different than my generation, right? And, and then there's a couple in between, right? And each of them has a lot of different things that have influenced them. And uh, some of the things that worked in my generation don't work with, with your generation or the one before you. <clears throat> and, uh, and vice versa, you know. <clears throat> um, you know, one of the things, though, that I think has always been around, but maybe it wasn't really cool to talk about it or to admit it, like in the olden days, and I think it's more acceptable now to talk about it and to, to kind of you know, recognize it, is empathy. You know, this uh, being able to kind of relate to other people and, and put yourself in their position and understand a little bit about them. I always felt like that was something that helped me. Uh, my father was a machinist in a factory. And when I was out there as a foreman trying to supervise these union guys who were, you know, had their own agenda, I could empathize with them a little bit because of the dinner table growing up, you know. I mean, it was all the same stuff that we used to, I used to have to listen to. Um, and, it, and it helped me to maybe get a little bit more done because I didn't just look at them like they were stupid. You know, I understood what, why they were thinking the way they were thinking or why they behaved the way they did. And I think even today, empathy is a really important um, skill set. And, even in the not work setting, you like to look around the world today, right? And all the different things going on in different places. And personally, I think one of my big problems is nobody, everybody looks through the world in their own eyes and they don't really try to look at what other people are going through, you know? And that's one of, maybe one of the best things about my whole career was all the people I got to meet from all these different countries around the world. Unbelievable. 
and in today still, I can go to an air, almost any airport in the world and bump into somebody I know. You know, it's, it's, it's uncanny, but it happens. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> so, so, you talk a lot about kind of entrepreneurial taking risks in different ways. How forgiving is a company like GE if you make a mistake? Oh, it's very forgiving. That's, that's, it's very forgiving. No, it's, uh, you know, if, if you make, like, you know, if you screw up six businesses, <laughs> you know, you're not going to, it's not that forgiving. But it's definitely forgiving. In fact, I'd say um, most people, in fact, I think one of the great things about GE was the reason they can, I mean, first of all, we had aircraft engines, healthcare, power generation, uh, you know, lighting and appliances, uh, electrical distribution, and control, all these different businesses, right? And what was the only common denominator was people. And, you know, the GE kind of culture. And GE could get people to go from one business to another because they have no fear that, I mean, they were told, hey, we got need you over here because we got a big problem. And people wouldn't say, no, I'm not going over there because that's a hard job and if, if it you know, doesn't work out, I'm dead. They would take, they would go do it because they would get the support and people knew they were in a difficult spot. They would, they would um, you know, treat them accordingly. So it was, I, I don't think uh, it's difficult at all. Now, I will say probably the people in GE are more hard on themselves in some cases than uh, maybe their the management tends to be uh, because they don't like letting down their team. You know, they don't like letting down the other people that they work with. So it's surprisingly forgiving. That's the thing. I mean, it's one not a company that big. One person can't can fail. Okay, it's usually it's got to be the team, or there's something wrong. There's the, they're not getting the right resources, or the right support, or they're not. You know, if now sometimes there's leadership issues, right? If you have a bad leader, somebody who's treating people badly, or is not uh, doesn't show the right values, that was the one way to get broomed out quickly didn't show the right values, and I'm talking about compliance uh, and, and uh, you know, the right values relative to uh, how you do things, right, and from people-related things to everything. But other than that, it was typically, you know, they would try to build the team. You know, say, well, I need somebody, I need an engineering leader, or whatever, they would help to get the right resources in place. Now, admittedly, the higher up you go, you know, it doesn't, it's not the same as when you're lower in the organization. When you're young, you get a chance to make lots of mistakes and you can recover from them. When you get to very high levels, it's harder, right? Because there's a public company ownership issue come into play as well. But people that I know that have left GE are all they all get great jobs. You know, they they're in they're in demand. No. Okay? Thank you. Amanda Hitterman and our fabulous boy band 
who have uh, kind of been the grandchildren behind events like this, uh, two Davids and a Sam, right? So they are, uh, they're the guys making so many great things happen for us here on campus. As, uh, as Dan mentioned uh, and talked about in his remarks, these events are a really wonderful chance for our, for us to do what we really do. People ask me, what do you do in development and alumni relations? We really develop relationships with our students uh, and our alumni with the university. And that should start while you're, you're here as undergraduates. What we want you to do in an event like this, and I hope you take a moment to pause and reflect on some of what Dan said, is to think about what this place will mean to you. Uh, you see the commonality of where you come from. I bet you a lot of you have a similar story to Dan in terms of where you're from. You see the big footsteps that other people from Clarkson have gone out there and, uh, and made in the world, and I think you get a sense of what's all in front of you. Teresa and I were talking about how young you all look. And I got to tell you, I'm getting older because you're looking younger every year. But your lives are in front of you. You're going to go off and do so many great things. And it's wonderful to be able to connect you with, uh, with Dan and a few others. Uh, now, I, I have a presentation here since I'm closing. Uh, so, um, this event is put on by the round table. You see this, I think, very clever symbol that we have to symbolize the round table, the golden knight, the thinking version of the golden knight, I like to say. And uh, what we wanted to do today was, uh, we wanted to say, first of all, that for those of you who don't know what the round table is, it is our leadership giving society, uh, a society that provides 90 plus percent of the dollars that make your Clarkson experience in so many ways possible. And we hope you will look down the road at ways that you can become involved and plugged in there. We created, and when I say we created, we just created this award specifically to honor folks like Dan, whose commitment to the university, whose leadership, and whose continued drive really helps us make us who we are. And so I will tell you, this is a prototype of the eventual medal, but it is on its way to you once it is cast by some craftsmen out here. But I wanted to no, give this a day. <laughs> Don't get Tony started. But so we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But please join me in giving, giving Dan a big round of applause. about an event like this is the chance to connect with um, some great luminaries from Clarkson. So we have Dan here, we have Mark, one of our trustees. You can even ask Tony the tough questions you want to, all over a lovely dessert bar, which I have been told is ready and waiting for all of you. So we hope you'll be able to stick around and talk a little bit more. Hope to see you at more of these in the future, and good luck on your finals, right?